Welcome to the main stage again for our, our final panel session here. I know that there's a lot of activity happening elsewhere in our zones, like our investment zone, so there'll be people coming from that session when it finishes very shortly. Um, we are moving on to the subject of money very soon. However, um, I do have a date for your diaries, which is the next Ignite Space. So, Ignite Space 2025, a date for your diaries is next year, February 5th to the 6th. 5th to the 6th of February, and where you're going to have to be? In Leicester at the National Space Center, a fantastic venue as well. Utterly free, so get yourself registered. The QR codes will be turning up. Here we go. Here you go. For Ignite Space 2025, we'll give it a mention at the end as well. Um, on the subject of money, raising capital in the space sector is a tricky one. Whether you're a startup or an established business or looking to scale up or maybe you're en route to exit as well. Um, we're about to have a really honest conversation and the route to finance with a venture capitalist, we've got Angel Investor, two businesses who've successfully navigated this funding landscape and looking at it from various perspectives. So we're getting the inside track on what each of these partnerships is looking for, how to pitch, even if you've done it a hundred times already, opportunities for investment as well, and that's whether you're the one holding the money or the space entrepreneur holding the equally valuable ideas, as we heard before, a very symbiotic relationship. So, if you can welcome to the stage, please, our panelists for this discussion are Shruti Ayenga, <laughs> Giles Moore, Evangelos Simpelidis, and Mike Stevens. Okay, guys, while you get settled, um, each of you has a microphone. You guys, if you want to ask questions, remember, get on the app, just go to the panel session and click on the live Q&A, and then everything that you send through, I can then uh, go through it and ask some of your questions. Um, let's start with a little bit of an introduction. Um, so, Shruti, you're from Future Planet Capital, and you're investing in, in early stage businesses. Tell us a little bit more. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I feel like I don't yeah. need the mic, but yeah. Um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Shruti. I uh, work for Future Planet Capital. Um, I run our space fund under the UK Innovation and Science Seed Fund. So it's a 110 mil fund um, that's backed by various UK government agencies. Um, and the space fund specifically um, is backed by the UK Space Agency. Um, so we invest out of that into early stage uh, space tech companies. So usually first check, first round in um, first institutional investment really. Um, and then I also sit on our ocean fund uh, on the investment committee of the ocean fund. Um, with the very early stage, yes. do you have a real buzz when you're meeting these people and you're kind of they're on the cusp of something that could you know, be really life-changing cool, yeah. for them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it can be really life-changing. Um, it can be very interesting, but sometimes so you, you get both ends of the spectrum. I feel like sometimes it's something that you think is really not going to work. You know it for sure, but the entrepreneur is really convinced it will work. Um, so you might as well just wait and see if it'll work and then potentially support them. In some cases, I think some people also don't realize how cool their innovation actually is because they're looking at one application, whereas we're thinking of it from a multiple applications perspective. So for us, it's really, really interesting and that's when we really get hooked on. Yeah. Um, so yeah. There'll be those moments of opportunity where you say, you never thought about this and the yeah. eyes go, yeah, we can picture yeah. it now. <laughs> um, let's move on to you. So uh, Giles Moore, Regional Manager of Par Equity. Um, you have a lot of experience in working with like global players on strategy. You've done brand management. I don't feel like there's anything you haven't dipped your toe into. Um, tell us what you're doing right now. Um, hi, yeah, yeah, so I'm uh, with Parakati. Parakati is like a, an early stage and a late stage VC. And I say that, it's always quite hard to give that messaging, but we do EIS, seed fund, and then we go, we launched our venture fund last year, which is for more series A, into Series B deals as well. So uh, it gives us now a really nice broad spectrum of what we can invest into. 
we're, one thing that's very different about us, we're a northern-based only fund. So uh, we set up, we're headquartered in Scotland, but we set up our Leeds office last July, which is when I came on board, and to lead that expansion. So Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, and upwards is kind of our cutoff on that side, so, uh, which is challenging in itself. I was going to say, that is actually, very sadly, quite big news, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Because most of the VCs are down south and in terms of some sectors just not leaving that golden triangle yeah. so is that why you set up this this office yeah i mean it's from the uh, get-go the um, all the founders of par have always done it where they wanted to stay in scotland and do make an impact in scotland and they became really dominant force in the scottish uh, ecosystem there and a lot of their kind of, well, for different reasons, loads of different reasons, from where the founding partners are from, to what we invest into, to where our passions are, we kind of saw Yorkshire as a really untapped area of the UK with a huge opportunity ratio. The, the, the challenge is, although there's ma massively more opportunity here than there is in London, the difference is it's spread all over the place. And it's not just in Leeds and Manchester, it could be in you know, Hull and Teesside and Lancaster and Morecambe, you know, so you've really got to spend time to get out there and see what's happening across the region. But um, yeah, it's a really exciting, it's really nice. I'm, I'm a northerner, I've had startups myself, and all my startups were in Sheffield, Leeds, or Manchester, and I know the challenges firsthand of raising money, so I really enjoyed seeing Pa's the thesis on being Northern Based Only Fund. Right, we will come back to that, um, and just pick out little bits of your story uh, <laughs> for the relevant part. I want to bring in uh, Evangelos, so tell us about your company and the stage that you're at at the moment. Yeah, so I come at uh, what we do is we produce components primarily out of carbon fiber and composites and this is uh, for aerospace and a little bit for automotive. Um, the benefits are it's a, it's a very novel process that was developed at the University of Bristol and we can build hands down the lightest components possible. Um, but also it's an automated uh, manufacturing process which is a big problem now with composites so we can produce lighter and, um, and faster. So we're now at the stage where we just closed our Series A, we announced this last week. Um, it's uh, 22.5 million dollars. It's actually the biggest Series A in composites ever uh, and is led by 8VC which is um, a top tier US fund uh, and also it's a first direct investment from the NATO Innovation Fund. Um, we've got also participation from uh, Science Conventures, which is a big multinational in chemicals. Uh, and we're now in the process of, of scaling up the business. So we're opening up our first factory in uh, Gloucester um, to really service the demand uh, for our product. Um, and yeah, so we're on this scale up journey, uh, which is yeah, quite exciting, I have to say. Um, yeah. Just to go back to something you said there, just to be clear, you yeah. said that you have had the, the greatest success of any Series A in components in the UK. So the, the greatest, uh, no, the, great, <laughs> the biggest uh, Series A funding round for composites. Wow. I, I don't know how much of a success that is, but uh, yeah. That, 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 sounds, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, it does sound good. If the, mo if the money's used right. If the money's great. used right, and that, that will, which yeah. I'm sure it will be in his case. <laughs> no doubt there at all. Um, that's exciting stuff. Do you feel, I mean, on the verge of this kind of scaling up, I imagine there's a, yeah. a sense of excitement, but also nervousness, you know, things that getting even more serious. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot more pressure now, but um, I think we have a great team, and, and that's something that we really enjoy. Uh, and yeah, there is... Uh, Things are accelerating. We're opening up our first factory. We want to set up operations in the U.S. next year. So, yeah, the, the pace is really picking up. Yeah, um, wonderful. Um, and then somebody who I was on stage with only yesterday, um, Mike Stevens of Entrepreneurial Spark. Can you just explain how you operate and um, and your also your own personal story as well? Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm here from two angles, I suppose. So. Uh, as a, as a founder, so we, um, we exited version one of Entrepreneurial Spark about six years ago, uh, and then I refounded the uh, company again and raised a small seed round to keep us going while we, we didn't have any revenue, um, and then have been through all of the trials and tribulations of rebuilding a startup uh, for a second time over that period, and we're now back up to a team of, a team of 10. So having uh, walked the experience myself over the last few years, and then obviously we run the UK Space Agency Accelerator, uh, supporting founders to, um, to raise investment, uh, 
Uh, we've got a series of programs that help people to do that, including Fusion, which uh, Giles and Shruti are kindly involved with. Um, and we, we have a demo day today, this afternoon, uh, happening shortly. Um, and uh, so this is one of many accelerators that we've run, uh, helping founders to become investment ready. And that is very much, you know, pitching your business to some investors. That is like, that's how that works, that kind of matchmaking setup. Yes, the, the, the demo day specifically. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think sometimes there can be a, a bit of an overemphasis on the pitch. Mm. And actually, it's all of the hard work that goes on behind the scenes of getting, getting the business ready so that all of the detail is there behind it. Yeah. We were hearing a little bit earlier, I don't know if you... <laughs> Space Forge, 157 pitches. And if he thinks back to the first time he announced it, he just basically had his name, his age, and where he was from on his first pitch, and then moving it forward. Um, if we're looking to where you can get this investment from, Shruti, you pointed to something very important, I think, which is the type of investor. So um, can you explain the difference between your venture capitalists and your angel investors, in theory? In theory, maybe not in practice. I'll try, and then Giles will help me. Um, yeah, well, I think we invest with angel investors, and we also invest after them. So we kind of ha see both, both sort of pre- and post-angel investment in a way, let's say. Um, and I think, you know, with your angels, obviously, I... I can't speak for them because I'm not an angel investor in space specifically. Um, but I think with angel investors, there tends to be a... They, you either meet them sort of through a high net worth, you know, um, collection of people or you have an angel syndicate that comes in and does the vetting for them and does a technical DD for them. Um, and the way we kind of work with them often is because the UK Innovation Science Seed Fund is quite heavily focused on the technical DD portion. Um, we've seen that more often than not, we end up doing a lot of the technical DD and sort of collaborate with them and share what we found with them. Okay. So that it becomes a lot easier for them because they are not resourced the way we are. Um, we are a fund. This is what, this is our sort of, you know, Brand daily, butter. yeah, this mm. is our daily job. Um, so we're a lot more well-equipped. We're a lot more well-networked um, because of who our backers are and uh, who we can kind of reach into, um, you know, the networks we can reach into. Um, so I would normally see sort of an angel syndicate coming in in that first round of investment um, at your pre-seed. And then as you move on to your seed, you know, there are some angels who like to top up, but oftentimes it's institutional funds after your seed, um, seed round. Um, and that's kind of the space we play in, at least our first check, and then happy to follow on if there's conviction and conditions are right and we're the right investor at that stage. And then the VCs? Well, the VCs go all the way, I think, from seed all the way to sort of, you know, you have series C, D, E, and then you go on to growth equity after that. Um, so that range of investments, I think, what some companies don't realize is oftentimes we're all talking to each other um, so if you've pitched to somebody and they've not invested in you, um, but they've had a chat with somebody, and you're, it could work both ways. There's pros and cons to it, right? So yeah. I was wondering about that because uh, do certain VCs in that network, I don't want to call it an old boys network, but I think there is a, a no, certain it's element. Not. There is well, a certain it shouldn't element be to it. Found there. Um, but are they, are they the gatekeepers? So say when you're talking regionally, oh, if you have a set of people and a business has been pitching to them and it just hasn't worked, it's something hasn't clicked, and then you have a chat to somebody else on the phone or you meet them at a networking event, you're like, hmm, I'm not so sure. So they end up as a gatekeeper to success in the region. Is that possible? Um, not so much. I don't think so. I mean, we, we obviously talk. I mean, that's really important part to share ideas, share feedback, share technologies. I mean, everyone always, founders always like to think their ideas, you know, the most unique idea, no one else is ever doing it. This is one of a kind. It's not true. I mean, we know that's not true. But what you're really trying to understand at different levels along the way, from when angels get involved to when uh, Shruti get involved and when we get involved, is there's different requirements as much. At a very early stage, it's really the team that matter. And that's a core thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very small, it's a really small industry in many ways. So word travels, so you've got to be really careful. 
as a founder or as an investor, how you come across and how you treat people. It's really key. I know that from when I, back in the day when I was trying to raise money and I got treated horribly and I told loads of founders and um, they still have never, you know, 12 years on have never raised through those VCs, even those VCs have changed hands many times, you know, because it still stays in people's minds. So you've got to be really careful with that kind of thing. But inevitably, I, I think, especially up the north, I, I won't, can't speak for the, the, the south, but up north, there is there's a huge area, uh, idea of, of collaborating together. <laughs> And everyone wants to help and support and intro people to whatever, whoever they can do. You know, we're unique, we're Northern based only, so we will always want to help and support Northern based only fund. If it's outside the North, we, we know who we can signpost it to, but we don't, you know, it's because we have those relationships, but we don't know everything that's happening down there. It's mm. not an area that we get involved with. But in the North, we absolutely do. And even if it's not right for us, I still want to be able to help out several businesses and say, go and speak to them, they're really good. If they've had a no from loads of people and they constantly get no's, then I think as a founder, you've got to be quite smart and understanding what it is. That mm. You've got to take on board the, the constructive criticism. And I say that because if everyone says it's great, it's like the mom test. If your mom says it's great, you're not going to get, she's not going to put money into it. If people are rude to your business, don't take on board people being rude, leave that. But when people are constructive with their criticism, there's a real meaning and power to that. And I think it's really important as a founder to take that on board and understand that and then change your pitch when you go back out. Look at what you're doing in the business and go, we're not doing this right. We can't get investment. Let's change it around a little bit and let's see. But, uh, but inevitably, and I had this conversation with someone earlier, it's so important as a, as a company, what you really should be driving forward to is commercializing the business, traction. Go towards traction, your business, go towards traction. Don't just do a business thinking, well, we need funding, otherwise there's nothing. Mm. You know, look at how you can get to market first. Because if you, that's your goal, then you will encourage investors to come on board that kind of, um, that journey along with you. A um, couple of things I want to pick up on there. Um, one is tapping into that trusted relationship. So when you've said there, you know, to, to co-founders, oh, you want to stay away from those guys, and that message being passed on, um, that's something that you, you must work towards building uh, in, in, in the long term, these relationships. They really do matter, don't they? Mike. Me, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And um, I think it was great hearing the story from Josh earlier on on stage of saying um, a number of people said no to him at the start, and then he, he did get some traction. He <laughs> did the things that he said he was going to do, and then he went back to those people later on, and they said yes. And I think there's a real power in that personal credibility of uh, demonstrating your resilience, demonstrating that you are someone who is going to hit those milestones, is going to drive towards something, um, and proving that to investors uh, as, as a way of getting them on board with you as well as the business idea. What is it like, though, as a, as a founder, when you're trying to get a message across? You might be given, as Giles puts it, you know, constructive criticism but you're just thinking, you just haven't got my story. You just haven't got the value. Is that, it, it, what does that feel like and how do you adapt? I mean, the reality is that uh, it feels like you're getting punched in the face all the time. <laughs> and, but, but you have to take it. And, you know, not many founders really like fundraising because it's, it's like a shock to the whole system. You have to really review the fundamentals of the business. Um, but I think ultimately it's a very good process because of the reasons that you said. You know, you get the fundamentals of the business reviewed by people who know what they're talking about, who've seen many, many businesses, who've seen businesses at different points, know what it takes to succeed, and you have to take that feedback and, and implement it into your business. And actually, you know, we've been fundraising for one and a half years, and the first, I think after the first three, four months, um, we realized we had to make a significant pivot in the business. Uh, and I'm really, really thankful we did that because, uh, you know, the floodgates opened after that and, and the business went on a completely different trajectory. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's for a good reason and you have to really listen to that feedback. Um, I will echo the comments uh, around, you know, <laughs> how small the industry is. And one example from our case, um, the partner that invested uh, from, from the NATO fund was at a different fund in the US. Uh, we reached the investment committee and um, they, they, they passed on, on ICOMAT, and, but she really liked it. And then she, she moved across funds and uh, she did it from her new fund. So, 
Do you think so, there is an element of, I know you, you're obviously looking at return on investment and everything, but is there a case of people buying people still? Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'd agree with Giles. Like, I think, like he said, early stage, you are looking at, is this the team that can raise the next round? Um, and if this isn't the team, then how am I going to help them once I get on the board? Because I think also what a lot of founders don't realize is that it, there's been this, this sort of um, metaphor that's been thrown around a lot, but unfortunately it is the truth, which is VC investing is, the process is like dating and then getting married. <laughs> I'm not married, so I don't know what that's like, but I think it's like that. Um, but, you know, all through that DD phase, we're really just seeing, um, is this the founder that I can coach, that I can also learn from, mm -hmm. but then is this the founder that I can be on that journey with till exit, right? Because you go in, you're an early stage investor, you're going to see multiple rounds, you're going to get diluted, but you're going to be sort of at least providing sort of feedback and advice at least the first two, three years of that investment before maybe you step away from the board and they have a new person come into the board. Um, so I think it's such a long term like journey that I have to have a good relationship with the founder. And so even if, uh, you know, earlier, multiple people have said this, but when you're getting feedback and if you're reacting not well to that feedback, and this happens both ways, investors as well as founders, right? Okay. Um, if you're not reacting well, then it's, it, it's really going to hurt that entire process. And then it's hard to come back from that and to still champion you. Um, is, is there parity in that relationship? Or is there... Because I know we, we talk about the SMEs, oh, you, need, you need the ideas, we need, and you need the money to... But is there sometimes a little bit of a hierarchy where the, the people holding the purse strings are actually I mean, in charge? <clears throat> you know what? I, 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 I spoke about this the other day. And I, and I had the same when I was raising money. You put, you, for some reason, you put investors on a pedestal. And we're not. And the founders should be on the pedestal. I mean, what's crazy is the founders are the ones who have sacrificed everything to go and start their business, which is the hardest thing you can do to sacrifice everything because of what the pressures you put into yourself, your friendships, your family, everything. But yet, then you go and speak to investors and they kind of then get scared and worried. And you're like, that should be the easiest part, really. <laughs> you know, because you've done everything. It's your life, it's your passion. It should just come across. I think it's really important that there should be a parody in that. And a lot of ways, I love founders that challenge me as an investor as to what an investor can add to that business because, and that's a question I normally will always ask a founder, if, we, if we're looking at the business and we're interested, I want to know what is it you want? Because inevitably, if it's just money, that's fine, but that's not us, we don't work that way, we're, we're, we get heavily involved in business and that's one thing I really like. So I want to know exactly what it is and that also opens them up to be quite vulnerable mm -hmm. and that's also nice to hear. You know, I spoke to a founder not long ago, he's actually three businesses, unbelievably successful, and he was, and he built a great team and he even said, there's two areas that I actually struggle with, if I'm being honest, and this and this. So I need someone to come in and really help me do that, which I thought was amazing, because actually he could have been sat there and gone, well, I've sold three businesses, I've, you know, worth 60, 70 million. I'm absolutely fine, but he didn't. And I, I really enjoyed that, and that really resonated with us at the firm, that you show your vulnerability as well. It's not, you've got to, it's an airing of confidence you need, but without the kind of cockiness and arrogance. And it's an area of vulnerability without showing weakness. It's a really, it's a, it's a weird, Very I mean, it's a game. Balance. It's a game, yeah. yeah. yeah well, yeah. It's, it's arguably a little bit like um, Dasha was saying yesterday um, from um, Astro Agency, where she was saying self-awareness has been one of the, the hardest learnings for any founder um, to know where your boundaries are and where your limitations are, particularly if you say building a team or looking to the future. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we've, uh, we've gone on, we've just done a Series A, and there's a couple of, there's four of the founders, and two of them, we work with them all the way through. We love them as people, they're great, but they, you, you can kind of see that two of them are really struggling now. They're, you know, they're in an area where they're really, you know, they're at the scaling, mm. scaling stage. Now it's really easy to go in and say, right, well, we need to replace you because this is now right, but we're not. That's not how we want to work. They're the founders we backed. So what we do is we've got two experts who are amazing there, who have exited in their field, and we put them in there to work with them for 12 months. And the idea is we want them to get this free support for 12 months, and, and at the end of that, they should be good enough to learn to keep going in that company. Does that but, sound like the type of added value you would expect to get from an investor, or is that something extra? 
Yeah, I mean, um, uh, not all investors will go to this length, but uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, once they decide to join the business, you're in this together. Um, and, and something that uh, you know, I make sure that, I, uh, and I value a lot, is I'm very transparent with the investors. If there is an issue, they will know first from me. Um, there's no hiding, we're in this together. Um, and issues will arise, um, obviously, you know, we're trying to grow as fast as we can, so the skills that are needed are not in the team, uh, usually all the time. So, yeah, I would expect them to um, to get people that uh, and suggest people that could join the team. I, I think maybe that's a bit, you know, above and beyond, and it's really great to hear that you do these things as an investor. Um, but yeah. Uh, what if? Because I also think there's a fine balance between. I'm just thinking of your skill set. So you come in and you've got, say, a branding idea, and you're just like, oh, guys, you, you know, you've created, you've got this great innovation, I can see the potential here, but your name's absolutely rubbish, you know, and your graphic, you don't know where you're going with this. Let me help you. And they don't want to take that help because that is part of their identity, that's part of their roots. Where do you go from in that instance? I'm picking branding, but it could be anything. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'd, I'd hope, <laughs> I'd hope we've had this conversation during the process in the DD, and we know we can have that kind of honest conversation. Robust. Yeah, I yeah. think, I think we would have had that conversation throughout that. I mean, if we turned up then six months after the investment and then suddenly said that, I, I would be happy for the founder to turn around and say, absolutely no way, this is what we're doing. You know, you bought into this vision and we're doing this and then own that space. Okay. There's no problem with that. We've had companies we've invested in, they've changed, you're probably saying, yeah. that they've changed their names. Yeah we've, had, yeah, we've had, I think in my previous fund, we had like four companies at one point that were all going to use the same branding service right after we'd invested because we'd kind of discussed with all four of them. I don't know how it happened. It was like, I, I chalk it up to the post-COVID investing phase where like everyone was just, yeah, some AI generator was churning these <laughs> names out and creativity was at its all-time low. Um, but, but yeah, we've had that. But we've also had it with a portfolio company where we've invested in them and a couple years later, they're going out to raise again and the material is just not high quality and we had to bring in a design team, we had to bring a sort of branding agency in um, and I was going to say about the, the difficulty when the founder is not seeing the need for it mm. is then we say me personally as an investor, I'm not saying the entire fund does this, we all have different profile, different ways of working I think as investors, I think for me I would say okay great I'm going to give you a, a mock pitch, I'll set it up with three of my investor friends, they will give you the feedback, I'll stay out of it. You, you hear from them because they can invest in you. You hear from them and if they feel like you can improve it, then you've got your validation from your next round investor. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take my only me, right? Um, I'm on your board, yes, but sometimes it's useful to just go out there and do a trial run and get the feedback from voices you haven't heard before. And I love the way that you're inviting your friends in. <laughs> You dare disagree with me. I do not, me. I do not, I'm not, I'm very, I'm very careful about not biasing them. So I usually, like, I don't even dial into those calls. Um, I stay out of it. But, um, but I feel like sometimes you just have to go out there and... It's market testing. Yeah, it's market it's testing, kind of exactly. Getting, yeah. 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 And you've got to remember, you know, as we see loads of businesses, we deal with loads of different areas of the world, with investors from all over the world, with founders from all over the world. So we'll always put forward different ideas. Because why not? I mean, we're coming in with a different eye, you know, different eyes. We're not the, got the blink of views or, or vision that uh, founders have. It doesn't mean they have to take it on board, but it's just worth, it's just different ideas that come into the party. It's the same as any in the team. You know, I always think founders should be really, should be really open to the whole team, thinking like an entrepreneur, thinking innovatively and having those discussions because why hire these people, especially your first few hires? Your first few hires really should be exceptional to help build your business. So encourage their ideas mm. and listen to what they've got to say because they might have something that's an absolute golden gem there. Um, Mike, you've had experience of a lot of businesses <laughs> of all different types. Do you think, you know, if we kind of just pull on this thread a little bit of exploring those relationships, because a lot of it does come down to trust. Um, a lot of money is changing hands, but you're building these relationships. Do you think, have you seen any challenges between the investors and the founders over the years? Yes, I, I think um, 
A, a huge amount of what we talked about comes down to um, mindset. We talked about resilience, we talked about emotional intelligence, mm. ability to handle relationships, uh, the fine balance between uh, humi uh, humility and confidence, willingness to listen to feedback, uh, control your emotions, all, all those types of things. So we do a lot of work on, on mindsets in the programs and um, people very often come in and go, you're gonna work on my what? <laughs> I thought we were here for business and finance and things like that. And, and um, uh, there's a real need for uh, developing your interpersonal skills uh, and relationship management skills at the same time. Because all of this, whether you're managing a team, whether you're managing investors, whether you're um, building your network or uh, sort of cultivating important stakeholders or working with customers or any of that, is all interpersonal stuff. Um, and conflict can arise in, in any of those areas. And I think there's a real... Uh, as, as Giles said, there's, there's a real tendency of founders to sort of be underconfident in themselves and maybe lean into a bit of people pleasing uh, quite often and then end up getting pulled in lots of different directions and not really sure what to do and making some poor decisions and things like that. And I think from an investor's perspective, when investors see that happening, that's where maybe some conflict can arise because... Um, they, they want the founders to stay focused, to stay purposeful, to stay action-led and kind of keep hitting those milestones. It's interesting because that kind of line of thought is something that came out with the SMEs into the primes where there was, you know, are too many quick to try and, you know, grab their attention and get in there instead of holding on to those assets for themselves and growing them from within. Um, in, that term, in terms of confidence there, because it, it, all of it seems to be about fine balance. So you need the confidence yourself to be pitching and know the value of your own business, but at the same time to be humble and self-aware enough to see where the opportunities are with the investors. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I, would, I would take it to, to the extreme. You need to be tremendously, you know, self-confident, you know, the ability to, to go with your head through the wall, but at the same time, um, yeah, you, you, and that's the truth. Uh, I mean, you need to to be able to understand where you're not good enough and um, and and take advice. And and I think that, again, I don't know. At least in my head, the investors are someone, uh, you know, an organization who has been there and, and done that and, and seen basically, as I've said before, businesses of different life cycles and and what it takes to succeed. And um, and, and that's something very very valuable. Uh, to, to have on your side. Um, equally, I think, you know, in, investors have a big portfolio. They cannot, you know, spend a lot of time with the business or they cannot spend the time equally. So you have to earn that right as an entrepreneur to, for, for them to spend time with the business. And at the end of the day, you have to perform. Uh, if they see that this business is going to drive the returns for the fund, that's where they're going to spend most of their time. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's uh, the truth again, I think. So. Just, just, just on one other bit on that, I think it's really important for founders, especially early stage ones, and especially in the space sector is a really good one, where you've got, you know, you, you so heavily focus on the product, and you'll get founders who meet investors, and they just want to talk about the product, and that's it. And that's great. We get that. That's your passion. And we understand that. And you found something, you've done something, you've driven it forward with the team. But you've got to remember that as investors, although we care about the product, obviously, absolutely essential, it's not the first thing we're looking at. The first thing we're really looking at is what's the commercial opportunity here that we want to see. And especially at our stage, it's probably, it's probably different for Shruti and then obviously for Angels. But at our stage in particular, we really want to know what's the commercial opportunity here. And it's one thing that loads of founders will speak to me. I'll have an hour with them and they'll give me 50 odd minutes of the product. And then it's six minutes of commercial mm. thing. And I, you know, it should be, it, I'm not saying it should be fully the other way around, but it absolutely should be the bulk of it. Should be about the opportunity, where they're going with it, what's the, op what's the market size, who, who's their customers, all this stuff. And then, oh, by the way, this is our, this is our product. I'm not saying that's the order you do it's it. It's about in, knowing your audience, isn't it? And, and about what the driver is. How do you risk, how do you assess the risk versus the potential return then? I mean, yeah, I, I think also like, um, Giles is right in the fact that we're earlier stage investors, right? So for us, the technical piece is super important. Um, how is it defensible? And what is the need for the technology, right? Whose problem are you solving? I think sometimes um, there's a tendency to be so um, sort of, it's a, it's a bit of a solution searching for a home, you know? Okay. And I think that's where the big challenge really arrives, is, is often seen 
within the earlier stage space tech companies, where I think people are, they come up with these really great innovations, you know. Um, they've come up with something that's very interesting, and then they kind of aren't able to find a customer for mm. it, right? Who's going to pay and who's going to benefit? And sometimes they're not the same person. And if it is, and, and also within those organizations of who's going to benefit and who's going to pay, there are layers. So do you know who you're talking to? Are you talking to the procurement person? Are you talking to the sustainability person? There's a lot of those questions which need to be sort of thought through. Um, and I think that's where we find it most challenging because what is VC investable is, regardless of us being that early stage, we're still modeling the financials out to exit. You know, we still need to see that exit. And if if, you, if, if it's not a business that you can exit from, then it doesn't mean the business isn't good. It just means it's not for VCs. It could be project for, it could be grants, it could be uh, other forms of non-dilutive funding, you know, innovation loans, um, so many things that are out there. Um, so I think that's where founders kind of have to go take a step back and say, okay, m either I make this a VC investable model or I go after other sources of funding. Yeah. Um so are there times where you are sitting with a founder who's come to pitch to you and actually you end up giving them a completely different roadmap? Yeah, I feel like it's common. Is it? We don't get asked this question, which is why I'm laughing, but it is common. Which is why I think also we end up kind of getting involved earlier and earlier, right? Because we don't want to come later. I don't know, it's sort of like, I don't know, I'm trying to find a uh, parallel, but it's like, you've, you've had a child, you brought the child up, the kid's five, the kid keeps saying they want to be an astronaut, and I come to you and say, no, you know what, I've, I've evaluated your kid, your kid should just be, should be an artist, right? I, I don't want to do that, I'd rather come in much earlier mm. and then help you in that stage, which is kind of why we get involved with th things like the, the Fusion um, Connected Capital Bootcamp, for instance, where it's so early stage, we're kind of mentoring them to yes. understand the markets, to understand the commercials, understand the questions you're going to be asked later. That's what it sounds like. It sounds more of a kind of mentoring business advisory position, really, with a yeah. lot of cash. Um, and, um, no, but, but to be honest, yeah. I have to say, though, that we have the privilege of doing that because of the kind of LPs we have. So yes. the UK Innovation Fund is backed by government, uh, government funding, right? So we have... Uh, MOD, so we invest in defense and security. We have a space agency, so we invest in space funds, or the Biotech Research Council, so we invest in engineering biology. A lot of it is investment readiness and then getting them to our IC. So there is times where we spend significant portions of that deal, um, deal time actually getting them investment ready sometimes um, and walking them through the paces of what's upcoming um, and then sort of, yeah, pitching them internally. So it must be a relief then for a number of founders that they, they, they don't need to have all the answers, but actually, they, as long as they've considered it in the, in the round, you guys could come in and just highlight a few areas, um, which might send them in a different direction. I mean, is this something that you've seen quite a lot, Mike? Yeah. I'm yeah, I mean, that's, that's largely what we do in the accelerators is we ask lots of questions so that when you get up in front of an investor, when you're in front of a customer, whichever environment you're in, ideally you're not getting asked a question that you haven't already been asked somewhere and have that awkward moment of, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, and then you can, you can go and find out. So it's uh, building that resilience, building the knowledge. I have to say, in the space sector compared to some other sectors, that understanding of the commercials is really something which needs a lot of development um, uh, just, just across the board of thinking about your business as a business, as a, 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 an enterprise, if you like, being really defined about what the route to market is, who you're going to sell to, how you're going to sell to them, um, and, and, and how you're going to create a viable growth enterprise out of this. That's something you talked about, Giles. I've been reading that you talked about the challenges of the mindset of um, moving from discovery to commercialization. And you feel that, that that is a tricky path for some. Uh, yeah, it is. I think, it's, I think it comes down to, I mean, a lot of it, we deal in, we deal in a lot of deep tech IP rich. So it's, so it's not the same as a B2C, mm. where it's probably a different space. You know, we're dealing with, a lot of time it can be very much academics in that. And academics by nature are not commercially driven. And um, <clears throat> so it's always really important if you're an academic either to start looking and helping yourself be more commercially driven uh, or find a co-founder who absolutely is. 
and will be that person who will face, be the face of the company to lead it forward. Um, yeah, it is absolutely. It's, it's, it's really easy to focus on the product, but inevitably, as Rudy said, it's, you've, got to know, you've got to know who your customer is, who you're selling it to, and there's an actual problem. We've seen amazing, some amazing solutions, and there's been absolutely no customer there. You know, and that you know, one or two or three million gone. You know, and they've had no customer, and they're and they're absolutely desperate uh, just to get some money. And you're like, but you've got, but, but who are you going to sell it to? Like, you know, you're just trying to get money just to survive for what reason? Like, oh, that it's is, so. That feels brutal. Even it's when you really said hard. that, yeah, because I mean, that is somebody's life. As you said before, they've invested in that. Goodness knows what their family's put up with and everything. You've given it all, yeah. but maybe for no commercial end. Um, is this something that? Uh, which role do you take on? Is it more the commercial head? Do you think with iComet, or is there somebody else within your firm that's been on the academic side really and, and pulled that in? Yeah. So <laughs> I took it. Uh, I think from the beginning, because originally I was a PhD student and, and ICOM had grew through my thesis. Um, we were very much focused on the commercial side from day one, um, because, yeah, this is a common uh, pitfall. So for us, market comes first, technology comes second, and that's how we always develop it, because at the end of the day, if you haven't spoken to the customer and, you, you know, you haven't gotten feedback on what you're developing, how can you develop the product? because the product can morph and, and go into many different avenues. So it was essential to do that. Um, and that stayed with us across the journey uh, of ICOMAT. Um, yeah, and it was a big part of, of us being able to raise Series A, that we had tremendous uh, commercial traction. Uh, so it's very, very important. That goal. And also, just on that, mm. it's, it's a thing that's really important for founders to, st to talk about what they're doing to the people. You have this, a lot of them, I don't know if you had this at the start, but a lot of founders I come across, even more so now, were like, oh, um, oh, I don't really want to say everything. You know, and some, I mean, I get asked MDAs all the time. Don't get me started on that. I absolutely, it drives me insane. But it's, um, I don't understand the idea of, of when you're a founder, you should be coming to any of these events and be really proud about what you're doing and developing. Because one, you don't know who you're talking to, but actually it's really nice to get people's feedback on what you're doing. But they'll be terrified of passing trade secrets on. No one, people, <laughs> I think you have people have this thing. One, no one's out to just copy your business, number one. And, if, and inevitably, if your business is going to be successful, people will copy it anyway, which really is a sign of success. So you're never going to get around the fact that no one's going to copy it. Everyone will copy it if it's successful and does well. But inevitably, if it's just an idea and you've just said, you know, no one, you d I'm not saying go into depth about what your pattern is and showcase your pattern and give it to them and all that stuff. But there's nothing wrong with talking about what your business is and being honest about it. You don't need to go to the cro into the, you know, mm. the crooks of everything. But being just honest about what your product is and talking about what your business is and where you're going with it. Because you just never know any time what can come up. And it's really important to realize that you, people, you know, go to events and, it's, and get out there talking to people. You don't know if someone could be a customer, they could be an angel investor, they could be a VC, they could be a potential partner, you know, any of these things. And it does happen, by the way. I, I, I've seen it myself, so it does happen. So it's worth the risk. Absolutely. So that, just, that don't give, just don't give you trade secrets. Yes. Keep the document at home <laughs> and, say, and say what you can say. But Halfway through yeah. the conversation, I just need you to sign this, <laughs> yeah. then we're going to move on. Um, a couple of questions here. So this came through, uh, how could the investment market evolve to allow founders to spend more time working on their, great question, on their innovations rather than being on endless investor pitches? What I, do you reckon? I, I learned this from a founder actually, because um, I was, he was somebody we'd already invested in and he was raising his Series A. And I remember he told me, I, I'd organized sort of a coaching session between him and another founder who I thought would help, would, would gain from talking to him directly. Um, and I remember he told me, he said, the only way to do it is make sure that there's only one co-founder who's actually focused on the fundraising. You know, because the business has to run in the background. So you can't have everybody focused on the fundraising. So split the work, have one person lead the fundraise, and make sure that you have a sort of cadence to when you involve the next founder or the, the additional founder, right? Um, so more often than not, it is the first and second meetings, he takes it on his own, he's the CEO. Then when they get into the, the techno-economic analysis, so the TEA, that's when he brings in his CTO. 
uh, but up until then, his CTO gets to really just focus, right, until the investor is very serious and is in the data room, is asking technical DD questions. Yeah. Um, so I think there is an element of managing investors and managing your time as well, and because it's precious and, you know, you're firefighting. So um, that would be my one, if I had to say one thing, it would be really splitting that, that sort of work and being quite focused. How have you guys managed that with your, your own companies? You want to go first? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, we, we actually took a very similar approach. So I had, um, when we raised uh, the seed investment for Entrepreneurial Spark, I had uh, three co-directors. And it was literally the case that I focused on the investment round and they focused on the operational and day-to-day um, -day elements of building the business that we needed to at the time. And that created some interesting challenges because as I was out, um, as I was doing the fundraising and talking to investors and things, I then had to go and sell that internally, almost because they hadn't been involved in that in, in those early stages. So I think it's important to uh, form those relationships up in the right way and form up how uh, how you're going to take things forward so that everyone is on the same page and no one expects to come in a bit later and then have a say on something that's already been agreed sort of um, earlier down the line. So did you have, I mean, how many pitches were you doing over that? Oh, we didn't do loads, actually. So um, we, uh, we, only, we, we only went out to a handful of people that we were sort of familiar with from version one of Entrepreneurial Spark and said, we're going to restart this. Here's a bit of a vision in the plan. Um, and we, um, and, we, uh, and we, raised, we raised that way. So we, we were very lucky in the sense that we knew investors. We had, we had a network. We had some very close business friends uh, from the previous iteration who we could just go to. They knew the team. Um, they knew what we were about. They knew where we were going. And, and we were lucky enough that they backed us. I kind of get the feeling there wasn't much luck involved in that, Mike. But uh, yeah, there was a fine. lot of hard yeah, yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Evangelos, what about you? Yeah, so from us, I didn't have an investor network to start with, so it was, uh, you know, quite a long process. And, and during that period, I was, um, which was good actually, I was less and less involved with the day-to-day -day operation of the of the business um, to the point where now we have uh, an interim MD, uh, really, really experienced um, and, and supports on that front. But uh, yeah, it, it took a long time. It took me, as I've said, one and a half years to build that network, especially in the US where we didn't have any operations. Um, and during that period, it was vital to keep growing the business. And to give you an idea, the investor that, that led around uh, basically had passed on the opportunity uh, a few months back. Um, and we kept hammering the updates. We said, okay, <laughs> no, this is going to work. And in the end, they saw that what we told them actually happened and, and more. Um, and, and, and that brought them back. So it's, it's absolutely vital you keep developing the business during that period. Um, and you act on the feedback that the investors give you. Like, you know, this horror scenario that you described earlier where, you know, they, they burned three million and, and nothing happened, wouldn't have happened if investors have given, you know, uh, mm. feedback on, on day one. And, and sometimes hearing a no is actually a good thing because you can do something about it. Exactly, and act on it. Another question here. Does space have a perception problem within investment? And how might the industry demystify it to make it more understandable for the investment community? Um, thank you to Andy for this question. This came up a little bit earlier, actually. It was in the cyber security panel yesterday, um, where they were saying, you know, there's two realms didn't necessarily understand each other. So you had cyber security, highly important for the future and sustainability of space, but completely different realms to talk about. Investment, do you want to mention space at the top? Or do you want to just say, here's your data, this is all of the invention I've made, and then at the back, it was from space? Like, it's a space tech company. Is that the question? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, I think there is a huge piece of education involved um, that, unfortunately, you know, but, but that's the case with any new sector. It's the case with any new subsector of investment, right? When, um, when we were coming out of the whole clean tech 2011 crash, and then we had to almost like scrub the word clean tech off and then make it now climate tech, and now everyone thinks it's <laughs> sexy and cool, right? <laughs> so there is, there's a lot of perception that's involved, but there's also this entire thing about education involved, which is it didn't work as clean tech because you were funding these massive farms, which were A, B, C, D, E, you know, challenges, versus now climate where we're talking about different 
thing. So anyway, there is an element of education involved. And I think with space, what ends up happening, but this goes back to the same point that I think Giles and I have probably been making uh, through this, this time, which is if you can explain your, um, your innovation and its use cases as an actual problem solution fit rather than a research project that's searching for a home, then it's quite easy to understand the commercial applications mm -hmm. and the market and you know why and who cares, right? Once you've explained that piece, then I'm less worried that it's space tech or it's fusion or it's cyber. What I'm really looking to see is that it's an innovation that someone needs and is willing to pay for. So I think if you can, you can't get away from the fact that space tech is new to a lot of people, that they have to upskill, they have to learn more, they have to understand what's involved with it. Um, but I think what you can do is try and explain it in terms of just brass tacks, and then it'll become a little less scary for investors because they understand it, and that's all they're, they're seeking to do, really. This is coming out also from a conversation um, about comms and marketing, and that space sounds expensive. Um, so yes, you've got the risk, but also it's going to be a lot of money to get there. So what do you say in answer to Andy? Yeah, I, no, I would have said that that's one of the concerns I think most investors have is, you know, it's a bit, it goes down the kind of therapeutics route or drug, drug discovery where the huge millions need to go into it and you actually don't know if you're going to get anything back. You spend all these millions and who knows in five to ten years time, are you going to see a return? And yeah, exactly. So it's, so it's really, uh, it's a really, I absolutely agree on the educational um, uh, process. I, I mean, I've been working with Mike and his team this year, so it's Rudy, and I, I've learned a lot about all the other areas of space that you can actually generate traction now and be really excited about stuff. A lot of that's in the data side of it. But, it, but it then, on the other side of that, does that rule out the kind of satellites and other part of the market, which actually could be huge? But then the issue comes down to, actually, I think you need the government support. You know, we, with the, I read the other day, we're the largest, second largest, sorry, uh, manufacturer of satellites in the world after California, and we don't have any way you can launch satellites, which makes no sense to me that if you're going to be so big in one side, but you don't have any way you can actually commercialize it. So you have to go to the US or you have to go into Europe to do that. Um, so, yeah, I think there's still a lot more education. I think it's really said it's a brand new market. Anytime there's a new market, you've really got to understand it. You know, as us as VCs, there's different types of VCs and investors. Some will just go on anything that <laughs> sounds cool and has got a massive wave of uh, influx of people into it. They'll just back that and they'll either do really well or they'll fail. We're, we're not like that. We have to really understand a market. And so sometimes we have to spend longer and we might miss out on some opportunities. But for us, we really, we don't want to just take a bet on the, like it's a gamble. All the, although most of them always are gambles. We want to at least calculate that gamble a little bit and also know where we could add value to it. So what part of space can we add real value uh, while we're learning what space is about and where this actually this industry could go to? But yes, I don't think it should be scary, I think it's just a lot more of an educational piece around it. Mike? Yeah, I was just going to add that there's a real, there's a bit of a nuance to the storytelling of space that I've seen from working with the startups in the accelerator over the last, um, the last few years, which is that lots of startups in the sector seem to start with, we have a problem with something or other and we're going to solve this problem by X, Y, Z. And it's the, def the definition of the we if it's something like um, a climate solution or something like that, it's we have this problem and everyone can agree that it's a problem and that it ought to be solved and that this, this company has a great solution to solve it, but it's getting down into the who has the problem in a way that they're going to part with money to do it. So instead of going, we as a society have this big global problem, um, who, who, is the, who is the customer that you're starting with and what's their pain point? Who specifically has a problem that they need to pay you to, uh, to solve? And just that one minor shift can radically alter the way that, um, the way that investors perceive you, the way that um, people, people talk about your business. And it stops being about the space and starts being about the market and the commercialization opportunities and, and, and th that type of thing. It is back to that commercialization. I think when you were mentioning there about problems with launch, there'll be, <laughs> there'll be people saying, yeah, okay, I'm going to get that. I've got a rocket. Orbex in the northeast, they'll be straight they're going, yeah, I can get my small sats up. I've got that. Um, another one here, how important is IP when considering whether to provide funding to an SME or a startup? 
Um, I mean, we have a bias towards IP. We, we, are, we invest in hardware and software. Well, our portfolio is 50-50, which is rare. But the reason we did that, we chose not to go down the therapeutic life science space. We've gone to the hardware, which is obviously takes a long time to get to market and a lot of capital expense, uh, extensive. But the uh, absolutely IP, deep tech, it all goes hand in hand with that. It's not essential because obviously, again, you can, do it, you can spend a lot of time, a lot of money on IP uh, to even get to the market and not even see the traction. Um, so is it essential or how big? Yes, for us. It's, it is important. We do like to see defensibility of, of a business. Whatever business that is, we want to know what your defensibility is. And if he's got some IP and some really clever IP, we absolutely love it. We're biased towards that, but that's us as investors. Uh, some will be different. Some it don't, won't matter to, but for us, it absolutely matters, yeah. And I know that something that matters to you, Shruti, is diversity, particularly within this space sector. Um, can you talk us through why and which areas of of that entire rainbow are we dealing with here? Are we talking with gender? Are we talking with ethnicity? Are we talking with... Yeah, I, well, I think it's beyond space for me. I think it's just generally early stage deep tech investing. And I think for us as a fund as well, we're very conscious of um, and are constantly kind of looking at where are we getting... Um, where does that, When we look at our pipeline, right, not portfolio pipeline, where are founders coming from? Who are these founders who are investing, who are uh, applying to us and who know about us? And I think it's more, it's very like, um, it's very telling um, of, it, it helps you understand how much people know about you as a fund, but also what you're not doing enough of. So there have been instances where we felt like we, we have a, we, we see a lot of pipeline from the south, mm. right? Where we don't see it enough from northwest for instance, um, so there will be act, there will be sort of active attempts to take trips up there, meet founders out there. Um, I think that's where it comes from for us. That we just feel like, as a fund, we would like to be supporting founders all across the UK. That was the that, that's the ethos of the fund, right? We've been set up for that. Um, but I think when you when you slice when you just look at the general founder profile, I think there is a the, overall in VC and then in in the founders who receive the funding. There's a lot of stats out there, so I'm not going to preach to, I'm sure, you know, the, the very smart audience here. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's generally an issue, right, with the amount of funding that goes to female founders to begin with. That's the low-hanging fruit stat statistic that is available for you to kind of read. And then you slice and dice it by ethnicity, you slice it by age, uh, you slice it by, I don't know, region, um, socioeconomic background. It just gets, you know, more homogenous. Um, that's that's generally the word I use. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, um, uh, you know, I, it's, uh, it's it's no uh, surprise, but who I am, the gender I am, the, the um, nationality I am, or the ethnicity I am, um, I don't see a lot of people who look like me um, in early stage deep tech, be it on the investor side or on the founder side. Um, so I think it's, and, and at the end of the day, um, you know, if you compare it to the diversity stats of UK as a country, mm. it's just not representative. Um, so I think there's so much more that can be done uh, to make sure that we are actually reaching people and, and we're making sure that the founders who look beyond, you know, the homogenous mm -hmm. sort of um, section of founders that we currently invest in largely, um, that they receive that funding. Um, and, and then it, you can keep talking about the biases involved and, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. So it's a very deep topic, I guess. <laughs> and Mike, is that something that you would have said completely, is very visible, very evident across the, the accelerator as well, the companies that are coming through? Yes, um, so we, of the, the couple of hundred companies that we've had come through over the last few years, um, we are around 20, 25% female, depending on the program, um, and around 50% come from an ethnic minority background. So there's a bit of a, dis a disparity between uh, the, the different um, uh, the, di the different backgrounds of people and, and where you find people in space. I think there's a real opportunity to bring in more people from different backgrounds. Um, there's, there's, a, there's work to do in, in bringing STEM uh, qualified people through, but there's a lot of other demographics to work on as well. So um, only 6% of the people that come through the accelerated don't have an undergraduate degree. And that's something that we've re we're really working hard on is how do we get people starting businesses in the space of different types who haven't necessarily gone to university, who come from different geographies, different backgrounds, um, different economic um, 
statuses and uh, how do we welcome them into the, into the ecosystem and, and uh, enable participation as well. Yeah, it's seeing something that might be beyond the, the, the small scope of what we think mm. the space industry is into something much bigger. Um, and Evangelos, I mean, is this something, this um, diversity of the UK market, is this something that we need to work on, do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the investors are a better place to speak because you, you've seen uh, what's uh, available on, on the market in terms of startups. Uh, from our end, uh, this is something that, uh, as a business, we take very seriously uh, and we've got a policy in place so we report to our investors metrics every quarter um, on, on our diversity and, and the people that we employ um, and yeah it's, it's a well-known fact now that diverse teams perform better uh, obviously I'm not a British citizen myself so um, yeah it's uh, you know we've got a, a pretty multicultural team at the moment at ICOM so, yeah. And just finally, a final note on finance. So if you have an SME who is watching this um, and maybe they've dabbled a little bit with pitches, haven't had loads of success, what would be your one tip? Um, I'll start, I'll work this way around. So Mike, what would you say? Uh, without repeating the one about talking about the market properly and the commercialization opportunities, mm. I would say uh, think about your delivery. So a pitch is a performance, just like anything else. Some people will respond to you in the way that humans respond to each other and will connect in with you and will like or dislike you within seconds of, um, of, of, your, of you showing up for the pitch. So People by people. People by people. Evangelos. Yeah, I think uh, for me the most important is to, to know your audience and uh, what they want to, to hear. Um, to give you an example, um, I remember when I was pitching primarily to UK investors, it was all about, you know, what's next? Uh, and will the company be able to raise the next round? So with this money, what will we do, etc. When I started traveling a lot more to the US, uh, and I spoke with a lot of founders there, um, because I was not getting great success, they told me, look, you're pitching it wrong. And I'm like, you know, how so? Uh, and they're like, you're pitching the next step. We want to see what's, what's the end game, what's the vision. Um, and, and that real, you know, small change made a huge difference uh, to to getting responses from US investors. So I think, yeah, knowing your audience is, is key. So maybe adapting culturally as well to what they expect. Relationships, major changes on that, depending which, uh, here which European investors you're working with. Some would like to work on the building of the relationship, others only want to know about ROI. <laughs> um, and what would be your, your tip, Giles? Yeah, uh, so obviously, 100% agree with that, researching who you're speaking to, absent number one. But I would say my biggest takeaway, and I took this away as well from someone at Sequoia Capital who once uh, said his nine worst things founders could ever do, and his number one thing, and it's always resonated with me, and it's true, is make sure you're asking questions to the investor. Don't assume because you've read their, you know, some sort of on their website that you know who they are and what they can offer, because an investor could turn around to you and say, well, I've read your website and I know what you do. And as a founder, you go, no, 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 I've got loads more to offer, you know, and it's the same thing. <laughs> So really, be, really, you want to be asking questions and finding out who the investor is because we want to know that you are choosing to work with us as a partner, not because you're just desperate for money. It's actually you want us because we, we will add value to your team. So have questions, ask questions, and want to know who, are they right for you as much as the investor is looking, are you right for them? It's that symbiotic relationship, yeah. isn't it? That real true collaboration, really, working yeah. through. Um, and Shruti. I think I would probably have to. Um, I would probably have to say just be open to constructive feedback, and um, and almost look at your investor, whether they invest in you or not. Whoever you're pitching to, look at them as a resource, right? What can you? What is it that even if they're not investing in you, finally, what is it that you can get from them? So if it's constructive feedback, get that, use it. There is nothing like receiving an email from a founder six months later saying, I told you I'll hit these milestones. You told me to come back. I've hit all of them. Then, because that for me is, Good yes, shit. thank you. <laughs> because now I can take this and I can go back to my investment committee and say, see, I told you we should have backed them. Can we please back them now? Because, yeah, so sometimes I think founders don't realize that individual investors get very passionate about, about teams and about, um, about innovations. And we've got a whole investment committee there waiting to grill us, and we need to defend this. So I always tell founders that once I've taken this through, when I'm taking you through the various phases, remember, we're best friends. We're on the same side. 
we need to convince my investment committee that this is a great investment. So, um, so yeah, just work on that constructive feedback and sort of make friends with your, your lead investor. Well, Evangelos and Mike, you have been doing just these things and have had great success. So uh, proof is in the pudding. Thank you so much for joining us. Please, can we just applaud our panel here? So we have Shruti Ayanga, we have Giles Moore, we have Mike Stevens, and we have Evangelos Zimpaludis. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a very quick turnaround before, on this stage, uh, we have our final session here, um, where we'll be in conversation with the man who next month is on a big job change, and he's gonna become the executive director of UK Space. So this is Colin Baldwin, a man who knows a lot, um, and he's gonna be here to talk about the direction of travel for the sector in each region of the UK, because I know we're covering quite a geographical spread here. So find out what the future holds. Join us here, half past three. See you shortly.